everybody. My name is Oliver Bradley. I'm the Germany or the German Italian language media representative for Europe Israel Press Association. I do my own advertising, so to say, because like a lot of organizations here at the table, we're always donor funded and we're always um, needing to justify our work, and it makes it always uh, it's always good for us to to speak about what we do. We work with uh, organizations and uh, mostly media. Uh, and try to uh, show the complexities of Israel, um, make people aware that things are not black and white. Um, and that always brings me into contact with very interesting people. Um, we're still waiting for Orna Pelek to come here, but I met her exactly two years ago because of my work here at the Israel Congress in Frankfurt, and it uh, brought us together several times not just on a friendly basis to have a nice pizza somewhere, but also uh, to do some media work to show what the Israel experience has been able to do uh, in the rest of the world. Um, and because I work with German and Italian language media, of course, uh, the organization that is uh, here at the table today uh, has been very active in Germany, perhaps also because Arna, being very fluent in German, uh, has been able to open a lot of doors for that. So what I will now do is just make a brief uh, introduction. Um, so basically, social innovation is the topic. Uh, social diplomacy uh, is, a, is a term that I have just learned a few days ago, reading the abstracts here from Natal. So I'm just going to read off because there's no reason why I start making things up when the experts have uh, provided me with good information. Social innovation, the future of the bilateral relationships, social diplomacy. How did the startup nation, and that's Israel, become the nation of social innovation? How can we transform local challenges into replicable and scalable solutions in an era of globalization? And of course, one of the, one of the uh, um, experiences that Israel has a lot of, which is very tragic, but at the same time we can learn from it, it's trauma. Uh, so Israel has had, um, you know what, that's, I'll, let, I'll let the experts talk about that. But what is Natal? I think that's very important. Established in 1988, Natal is an apolitical nonprofit organization and it has worked a lot um, in supporting victims of trauma caused by terror and war. This is how I met them actually a couple of years ago because they have been working with trauma victims um, from, let's say, this mostly Syrian and Middle East crisis, uh, especially here in Germany and from the refugee. Uh, camps. So uh, their aim is to, wear, is to increase awareness and that is what they will do today. And what I would like to do is uh, introduce the panelists here. Um, I will start also in the order of how they will speak. So Ophir Pelik is CEO of Social Export Italy. Ah, I'm sorry, Israel. <laughs> Well, I don't mind taking I, I'm in Italy literally almost once every other week, so I'm sorry about that. Apparently I don't go to Israel enough. Uh, excuse me. Um, but maybe you can start that also with Israel and Italy and all these other countries. Uh, he's a lawyer, specializes in driving uh, for the show. Well, yeah, Israelis and Italians have that uh, common uh, way of driving and clapping on airplanes. Um, so he's a lawyer um, and has extensive experience in building international networks and developing associations and organizations. Uh, I will let him then uh, go deeper into, into his background. Then uh, all the way to my, my left, so to your right, is uh, Jörg Frank Greis, um, a social entrepreneur from Germany. Uh, he is an uh, expert in pedagogical, pedagogical science. Excuse me. My English, I haven't lived in the States for 29 years, so. Um, and he works, uh, has managed different German organizations, uh, such as the Blankenheim Institute, uh, which uh, work with 170 homeless people uh, with special needs and home for the elderly and nursing homes, uh, including Casa Reha GmbH. He's currently the CEO of GPE, a nonprofit organization that aims to provide professional qualifications, measures employment and integration services to people with psychological disabilities. And then to my left, I have uh, Orly Gal. It's nice, that this panel, that we only have one person with the name Gal in her name. In the one previous, we had three Gals. Uh, maybe we should actually learn what does Gal mean? Wave. 
Wave, okay, so we had a wave of God. We had a tsunami. <laughs> now we had a tsunami of God. And now we just have a small, a small wave. Exactly. Um, so she joined Natal 25 years ago. Um, no, 12 years ago. Oh, 12 years ago. Oh, so listen, I'm just going to read off the <laughs> so Early joined Natal after a prestigious 25 year career in the IDF. Her last position was deputy IDF spokesman, and she was responsible for the entire public relations department and commanded over 1,000 soldiers. It's a pity that you did that after I started my work because we do work with the IDF and it's always very pleasure. Oh, yeah, thank you. Oh, okay, that's, that's, that's great. Um, she served also as secretary of the high command of the Israeli army. Orly has a master's degree in public policy. Since joining Natal in, uh, as the CEO in 2006, as a result of her public relations experiences, she has significantly increased the public awareness of PSTD, post syndrome syndrome traumatic disorder, and destigmatize the need to seek help both nationally and internationally. And I think this is one of the big topics we all talk about, destigmatization of, of people's uh, traumas and, and uh, let's say, things that people have gone through in their lives. People should not be in the closet when they need help. And so I think Natal has been very, very, very active in this. So without further ado, I would then pass the voice over to Ophir. Um, okay. Hi. Ah. I'm going to make sure I'm going to be in one of those minutes. So, um, hi, my name is Ophir. I studied law in Tel Aviv University. I was there working with the Israeli uh, education organization. So, I was managing a big department uh, with four staff, 150 volunteers. I was later on moving to the Israeli government and working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a lawyer. The international lawyer, where we had uh, numerous uh, negotiations, especially with the European Union, on various issues. The main one uh, is Open Skies Agreement, which allows us to fly cheaper to Israel and to Europe. So uh, it was one successful negotiation. Um, after that, I was a strategic consultant for Israeli NGO for three years, uh, where I kind of uh, understood the complexity of working with. Sad in, with such a diverse society uh, such as Israel. In the last two years, I had uh, the privilege to combine my both passions, which is international relations on the one hand and Israeli civil society on the other hand, um, and start helping uh, various Israeli organizations to have uh, international capacities. Um, because, you know, we, we are working with different fields, I don't know who are, whether we're working for the banks in the industry or for the agricultural industry or for the pharma industry. Um, and for those industries, it's quite common to share uh, knowledge and to have kind of agreements between international actors. I mean, probably you do it every day, you trade ideas and you trade products. However, us in the social world, no matter whether it's in Germany or Israel, uh, perhaps only the CEO or the VP will go once a year to a conference and share the ideas. The people themselves are isolated. And the, and the answer is why in this era of globalization we have to cope with our problems alone. Uh, challenges are similar. We just had a panel before about uh, dealing with refugees. And, um, and the challenges are similar and a solution as well can be uh, seen, uh, can be and should be uh, similar. So, uh, what we've been doing is uh, encouraging Israeli uh, civil society to export and share the knowledge um, outside of Israel. And I'll start with saying what is um, what is perhaps uh, the um, characteristic of Israel. Uh, first of all, I think it's a no, I think it's a social democratic country. Uh, meaning that the state still funds the vast majority of the social services. Uh, however, uh, we can see that there is uh, innovation and entrepreneurship that perhaps can be seen in more of the capitalistic countries, uh, if one can say. And this, uh, and this unique combination of it creates uh, a vibrant civil society uh, that is able uh, to create solution in a perhaps quicker or more innovative ways. Um, but it also goes back to the history, because I think that in Europe uh, and elsewhere there were some sort of countries uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, between 70 to 100 years ago, they become uh, democracies and perhaps government allowed 
civil society to operate. And in Israel happened exactly the opposite. Uh, civil society created universities, created Kupot Kulim, uh, created health insurances, um, created civil unions, it even created armies. Yeah? We had three armies uh, operated by the civil society, and only then civil society were able to establish the country. And I think that this dialogue still exists today, in a way. Uh, the um, uh, government does expect civil society to come and to innovate and to initiate and to be their um, incubators of change, uh, which is something that we uh, still see today. Um, what I want to go through is to give you um, three examples. Uh, the other two examples are going to be better put by Oli and by Yog. Um, uh, three examples of how uh, different uh, Israeli organizations were able to create uh, a model out of the many, many, many challenges <laughs> that the Israeli society faced. Um, so if, if I can go through quickly about the successes of the Israeli society in the last decade, um, I want to focus specifically about pro-IT and science ecosystems. We see there is a big need of the IT industry in Israel to have more and more trained uh, employees and to cope with the skill gap. And how can we actually touch the students in young age and convince them to go towards STEM studies? When I say STEM, science, technology, electronics and mathematics. Um, the other is uh, uh, employability of disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities and um, social inclusion. Uh, we see, if we take uh, about the employment, for example, of uh, Israeli Muslim women that were only 13% 10 years ago and now approaching 32%, so it was more than double than a decade. This was not out of force, this is out of social change. Um, and if we can see the inclusion of people with disabilities, for instance, uh, and uh, um, um, employment around 55%, one of the higher in the West, also uh, in accordance to um, social change. Um, we'll give you a, f a bit more in-depth uh, example. Uh, we see uh, that, as you know, underprivileged group in society uh, tends uh, to be less active in the academia and then perhaps less active in the open labor market in general. In Israel, we do have national minority, if you want to say so. I know in Europe it's less common to speak about national minorities, but when we speak about the Israeli Arabs, we um, this, and we see that the common challenge in this, kind of, uh, in this kind of communities is to actually convince them to take part in the academia, but also to remain in the academia and from there directly to the open market. And the common challenge for both Israel and Europe in that extent is to minimize the dropout of excluded community from universities and actually to attract them to universities to begin with. Um, and how and how do we do it uh, in a better way? One organization in Israel called uh, uh, Aluma, and they understood that the academia should be the institutional meeting point of, uh, of uh, different uh, parts of societies because you know we all work, we all study in different schools. I know that in Israel uh, some schools will be richer than others. I know that in Germany you have the gymnasium that perhaps are more uh, better equipped than others. So the question where do we meet other parts of sector or classes in society? And the academia can definitely be a, a, a part of it. But it also changed the way that they look on academia and say dropout is something that uh, harms us all. It harms us all because it harms inclusion. It harms the economic development of uh, excluded communities. And thirdly, it harms the income of universities themselves. Because if you have a dropout of 30% from mathematics or science in the first year, you have 30% of empty seats for the next three years. So they managed to go to the universities and convince them to pay them to have this kind of dropout prevention um, program. And they're focusing on two things. First of all, working inside as excluded communities, having a coordinator, a paid coordinator, in each and every closed community in 40 different neighborhoods in Israel, uh, meeting them in high school and promoting, and promoting their access to university from a young age, advising them consultancy, 
having extensive dropout prevention program inside universities themselves, and, uh, and then have the lead to the open market. Uh, we, they saw a reduction, reducing with 50% the dropout, and then 40% of those who drop out continue to study uh, different fields in the same universities. Uh, so this is a great economical impact, and out of a decade, we see that within a decade there is a rise of 82, almost double, 82% in numbers of Arab students inside of, uh, of Israeli universities, and we see uh, there is a great um, social change and impact in that. The other uh, uh, program, which also fo focused on minorities, is um, uh, touch the economic challenge and of, on the one hand, IT industry that is striving to grow, however, is lack of employees everywhere. There is an IT industry, there is a lack of employees everywhere, also here in Germany. Um, and on the other hand, there was a challenge of uh, people from the civil community, especially Israeli Muslims, that wanted to take part in the society. We see the, call, the um, challenge also here in Europe. If you can see in Germany, these are, uh, the, uh, these are uh, statistics of the OECD showing that in Germany, for instance, um, where you have uh, 40 percent, uh, this is uh, about over qualification, meaning people who graduated universities and how hard for them is to find a job that suits their skills. So overqualification amongst, let's say, German names is going to be 11%. However, uh, people who came from MENA origin, Middle East and North Africa, are about 40%. We saw the same, we saw the same problem, which already with the same results in Israel. Uh, people who graduated universities with Hebrew names had easier time to find a job than those who graduated universities with Muslim names. Um, and the idea was then to take graduates from Israeli, uh, from Israeli universities, uh, especially from the Arabic sectors, and to retrain them, retrain them for the open market after they have finished universities. Because what's happened inside universities is that you get the skills, you get, for example, in terms of IT, you learn how to do coding and C++ and Java. However, IT is not only uh, a language, it's also a culture. And it's how to, to teach culture. Um, so the problem is that they were graduated with a lot of success, but they wasn't ready enough for the open market. So they did the reboot camps for four months, training them with the industry, with Google, with Facebook, to actually uh, tackle uh, their their um, cultural challenges and to make them market ready. Uh, how to work in a group, how to question your boss. It's very hard sometimes to close and to the community to question the leader because uh, the sheik or the rabbi or these kind of uh, people are uh, usually are not being questioned. Or if you want to succeed in the IT, if you want to be innovative, you have to be able to your boss and say, you're wrong. Um, so this kind of training and the success was absolutely um, enormous. You can see here in Nazareth, in uh, Israel in general, between 350 Israeli Arabs in the IT industry in 2008, more than 6,000 today. Uh, position in Nazareth became, uh, we call it the startup wadi. So uh, Nazareth became a really big startup hub from 30 position alone to 1,200 position. Israeli Jewish people coming to Nazareth to work in the morning in the IT industry in Nazareth. And the economic impact is absolutely outstanding, both for the, uh, both for the IT industry and especially for the people themselves. I would like to um, um, close by saying is that uh, I think that the future of um, relations between countries is exactly in that aspect of sharing these knowledges and seeing how social models can be adaptable and how can they they'll be scalable because our challenges are similar. And most of our work is to bring uh, local Israeli NGOs to partner with European NGOs and other NGOs on the basis of sharing this know-how, learning from one another, and also creating programs together um, to take innovation from Israel outside and to bring innovation from outside of Israel to Israel. <coughs> 
And I will conclude by saying is that Israel and Germany are lucky. And they are lucky because, first of all, we have a strong economy. I mean, uh, around 4% unemployment. This is unheard of in the two, of the two uh, economies together. And secondly, we have both of our governments paying for social services. So the question is, uh, what do we do with Islam? Uh, do we wait for the change or do we bring the change ourselves? And how can we take the similarities and the differences in between our two cultures and between our two civil societies and try to create uh, solutions together? So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. So right now I'll ask Jörg Frank Reis to contribute. used to speak English uh, all the day, so I try to do my best here. My name is Jörg, I'm coming from uh, GPE. GPE is an organization uh, running in Mainz. Uh, we are founded in uh, 1985 and we are an NGO, a non-profit organization um, with about uh, more than 300 employees at the moment working at uh, 23 locations, uh, mostly in Mainz and the district of um, mainz -Bing. Yes, we're taking care of people with uh, mental disabilities, uh, people uh, suffering uh, from schizophrenia or affective disorders, stress-related disorders and all kinds of psychological problems. Our, the things we are doing is that we are uh, looking for employment for these people at the first labor market. Um, we are also an employer for these persons on the shelter labor market. We are offering uh, vocational rehabilitation and a kind of support in everyday life, uh, leisure time and housing. So over the years we are developing a highly uh, differentiated service program. Uh, we are running social firms, a uh, sheltered workshop. We have a center of labor diagnostic rehabilitation and a community-based um, dare care center. We have a place, meeting place for young people and projects of additional earnings and a new project of uh, city beekeeping. Yes, I, our social firms, uh, we have a small but very nice hotel in Mainz. Uh, we are running, we are running uh, four supermarkets and uh, two restaurants. These are all enterprises uh, in the first labor market. So this means that uh, people with and without handicap, they get the same uh, salary, the same wage. And uh, in the social firms, there are about up to 50% workers with disabilities. We have a uh, not big, but very nice sheltered workshop. Um, the specific thing of this sheltered workshop is that is not on one place, but it's distributed all over, over the city and uh, the district of Mainz Bingen, so that we are really included into the community. And uh, so we are running a book binary, a print and mailing office, uh, some kitchen canteens, uh, we have a nice coffee shop, uh, laundry service, and we are running uh, the hotel kitchen. Also including in this uh, chat workshop is 
that we are um, offering uh, 41 places uh, in companies of the primary labor market. Yes, in our center of, uh, for labor diagnostics rehabilitation, um, we have a center for occupational therapy, uh, we do a lot of uh, working diagnostics or labor diagnostics, and we are running different um, programs, training programs um, for people who are suffering um, from any kind of uh, mental sickness. There's a community-based psychiatric center and um, people can uh, go there every day uh, and get support in living support, uh, crisis intervention, any kind of um, health promotion. There's a small, we call it coffee for young people, uh, where people can come um, if they start suffering uh, maybe from schizophrenia and they get confused and uh, they feel that they are not like everybody else in their class, they can come to this uh, what we call Café Unplugged and meet other people and uh, come together with uh, um, the social workers to support them. We're running two different <coughs> projects of additional earnings. Um, one is uh, the second hand shop for plus sized or oversized, a little plus size woman. <laughs> and uh, the other thing is a candy factory. And I just mentioned the special beekeeping project uh, where people with and without handicap uh, taking care of bees um, in the city. So about one year ago we got visitors, visitors from Israel, from the Czech Republic, and uh, we learned that there's an organization which is nearly doing the same things um, we are doing uh, in Mainz. Uh, it's also a non-private organization, uh, it's also community-based, they are offering vocational rehabilitation and supported employment. They are taking care about 3,000 people with socio-psychiatric um, or other disabilities. And um, their goal, their main goal is um, to assist um, them to um, get a life goal and to decrease the stigma in the society. So it's really the same things uh, we are doing in small. Chikal Tov is doing it all over, over Israel. So we found out that we are, have similar goals and similar values. So both organizations um, are determined to lead the way in their countries in the promotion of social inclusion of people with psychiatric disabilities. Um, we both are empowered uh, by our partners uh, to be innovative and creative uh, practices and more tools. And um, we are both interested in sharing ideas uh, together and working with other organizations uh, for us inside Europe, of course, and for Czechoslovakia also in the Middle East. So we, we started working together and uh, we um, tried to establish, uh, to learn one from each other. We are uh, speaking about joining projects and uh, getting people together, um, the, the, like social workers, but also people with handicap um, may come uh, to visit, do visits in Germany or in Israel. In a moment, it's like a small plant. It's not, not so big in the moment. Uh, check it out off and we change visitors in uh, 2017, 2018. Tomorrow, two, two people, two members of Check it off uh, will give a seminar um, to uh, our employees and uh, cooperation partners. Um, hopefully, we will sign a letter of um, cooperation or agreement of cooperation in January and we are planning uh, to um, exchange employees and service users as well. 
So we are very grateful for this cooperation and we are looking forward to what uh, will be coming in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Guys. So now I will call uh, Oli. The wave. The wave. The wave. The wave is coming. I'm sure that you are very tired. I'm sure. And I'm going to start if I will not be able to show the short movie. I, will I think this was her third attempt, so let's uh, wish her a lot of luck. Today that I couldn't do it. I'm going to show you a movie and then you will say, then I will explain. So first of all, I suggest that you will see Asman, you spoke like that? Yeah, please. It's Thank okay. you. It's stress. Oh. We all know the feeling. Yeah, but we don't see it. We don't see it. We don't see it. Our heart beats fast. <laughs> Our palms get... Please. Now you are here, so... Uh -huh. They have something against me. What did they say? Something big. You know what to do with him? No, we cannot show. Excuse me? It is on time. Uh, I will have to start. Uh, oh, this is really unbelievable one. But I will just say a few words about uh, uh, Natal and then I hope. Uh, to show you um, the short movie. So, no. Uh, okay. So we exist uh, 20 years. We are uh, a political organization dealing with all these ways. Jewish, Arabs, from I'm sorry, from little kids to adults, veterans. What's there? What's there? What's there? Okay. Um, I like to underline the Israelis are very innovative for a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, not no. always technology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also Germans, the same thing goes for Germany. There are, there are you know, we, we're talking about common ground. There are communists. Every time I sit in the train and it goes in a tunnel and, it, and my phone doesn't work, I'm still surprised that in Germany. <laughs> Okay, so I will continue and we will see. I hope that it will uh, uh, work. So, uh, Natal is a social uh, innovation. I will explain it in a minute. Uh, we are working all over the country from the north to the south. Actually, I live like 25 minutes from the border with uh, Gaza. Um, and, oh, and we have a unique model. If you will look on the model, first of all, you will see the treatment. We are dealing with people that suffer from terror and war. And we always deal with the circle around them, the families. Now, on the clinical part, this is the people that we deal with them. But on the training part, trauma is trauma. So it can be violence, it can be bullying, it can be a lot of things that uh, we we'll match uh, and we, uh, with our experience, can give a uh, treatment. So, um, resiliency. You know, on these days, and especially in Israel, when you move uh, so quickly for a um, regular day to emergency, uh, you need to be ready. And Natal is working a lot with preparedness, prevention, with kindergarten, schools, first responders from police, for example. We work on the last three years with 17,000 policemen, commanders, and special units, firefighters, um, you know, medical organization, and so on and so on, hospitals, municipalities. So we give them uh, the tools. Uh, we are doing a lot of intervention when it, there is an emergency time, a lot of helping the helpers, and the day after to come and to, you know, we always say Natal return to life. I try to give you all the, the uh, tools or the ways to return to life. Awareness, this is one of the things 
cannot show you, but this is one of the things that we are, uh, we just got a, 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 a plus. A reward for the advocacy that we are doing uh, in Israel. We are a lot in the uh, media, we have a media campaigns, a magazine that we publish of more than one million copies, a color run and so on and so on. Research. Ah, okay. I will show you, you know, we have a lot of veterans that suffer in Israel from post-trauma. And we have a macho society, we say, a macho. Things change during the years, I have to say. But the way that we choose uh, to show if it will work, we never believe. It works. Okay, it works. Hey, babe. How was your day? ago we <clears throat> in one of the program in the TV we put this uh, we asked them to put this short movie and 80,000 people they like like and then we started to get so many phone calls to our headline it was like wow so continue and we don't put it just in the TV it's one in the media internet Facebook and so on and so on. So this is uh, an example of a French touch. Can you <laughs> Now we know why it's a macho society. <laughs> ah, no. Can you believe that I was a colonel? No. Um, okay. Um, I want to say until now, Natal uh, support uh, more than 300,000. Uh, people in Israel, like I said, from little kids to adults. I want to move to social expo. Oliver asked me in the panel before, how you, you know, how you live? From where do you have money to live, you know? Usually it's the problem of all of us in organization like uh, uh, we have. We did a strategic uh, process. We actually, we are doing every three years like this. And uh, we did it uh, like eight years ago. We started with understanding that it's not enough to live on donations. And the government gave to Natal like uh, less than uh, 1% in the past, until four years ago. And we said we need to find a way. And then we said we have so much experience, so why we will not share it? Why we will not export it? We really believe on dialogue, and we believe that we shouldn't come and say, listen, we know everything. Believe me, we are coming, everything will be okay. And we don't work like this. And what we uh, really uh, did, first of all we did, we put a target audience, and we said, okay, if you would think about Natal, they we think that I will work with psychologists, for example, or social workers. And we said, no, we are going to work with leaders, with managers in the uh, municipalities, in first responders, uh, because we will try to give them the tools to be ready 
for everything that will happen. It doesn't have to be just terror uh, attack. It can be um, a... Huh? <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Okay, so so uh, we decided that we really want to try to give the, the tool for a crisis management, for example, for leaders that they will use it and they will be ready with the municipality, with the police, with everyone that needs to operate in a emergency a time. Second, you know, we have we have a different culture. Every country, but Israel, you know, in Israel you can ask everything. You can ask even how much you earn. In America, for example, you cannot ask anything in an interview. Hmm? <laughs> Not you are like American, Italian, and German, so. Uh, so we had a problem. We have a different culture. We need to learn about different culture. Everyone say, go to work in Europe. What do you mean Europe? Every country completely different. Germany, England, Spain, you know, Russia. So we decided and we chose two places. The little America and Germany. And you will ask me, why Germany? The That's reason why. <laughs> so you prepare the best question in the world. So uh, why? So in 2009 we had a very big operation. I call it like a small war. And what day? It was on Friday at two o'clock. I will never forget it. I got a phone call, and um, he said, "Hello, this is the ambassador of the German government." that sit in Tel Aviv, and I want to speak with the CEO. So I said, yeah, I was sure that someone is like faking, yeah. you know, this telephone. I said, are you sure you want to speak with me? He said, yeah. I said, okay. So he said, listen, we decided today, it was the third day of the, this uh, big operation, we decided to support Natal of taking care of the uh, children in the South. We also decided to choose a Palestinian organization in Gaza that they are doing the same. Said, wow, I love it. I didn't know yet how much money we will get, but we said it's, it's a great opportunity because the kids' situation in the South, and we are doing a lot of research, I can tell you 72% from the kids in the South uh, suffer from symptoms of post-trauma. So we said, wow, all of my fantasy, not just one, I mean Natal's one, <laughs> can, uh, you know, we can solve all the problems in the South. And then they said, give me your phone call because phone number, I need to call to be sure that this is the German embassy in Tel Aviv. I did it, and it was him. And they decided to give Natal, I'm telling you, the amount of money, it was 250,000 uh, euro. I like almost fainted, you know, it was like on the middle of the world. So we started the relationship, an unbelievable relationship, I have to say, with the German government. And I had even the Akavod, the privilege, uh, to meet the Angela Merkel in Jerusalem. In fact, I have a picture, if you will say that I did it. But in any case, it's really, um, we have for five years, uh, the German government supported Natal, and we built a whole process of, um, or a model for children. And when you said before about schools in Germany, or schools in different places that have different culture. It's like in Israel, Jewish, Arabs, we always need to, to accept the other. We believe in it, and this is the reason that we built, um, like I'm running, I, I just want to go to school uh, for a minute, show you the movie that I wanted to start on the beginning. We started to uh, build a whole setup 
and we built an internet site that now you will find it in 80% from the schools in Israel. And we said, look, the kids have a lot of fear and anxiety, and from exams, from bullying, from violence, from terror. It can happen from a lot of things. And we need to find a way to give the teachers the tools, how to work and how to help to these kids. So we have, I can show you like, I hope so, a short uh, example of one of the short movie to see how in Israel we help. Okay. I'm too scared to even click. <laughs> <laughs> and he left here. Uh -huh. So, Stress. It, listen, how it is. we all know the feeling. Our heart beats fast, our stomach tightens up and cramps up, our palms get sweaty. We either become angry and feel like screaming, or we fall silent and feel like we can't speak. It happens to us all the time, when we have to speak in front of a classroom, or take part in a competition, when something frightening happens, or when we're waiting for an important message. Why didn't you answer me? Life is so stressful sometimes. But wait a minute. What makes us feel so stressed out? Is it all the people around us? Our family, our teachers, our friends? Is it all of our chores and responsibilities? Homework, after school activities, tasks? Yes, but those aren't the only causes. Where does all the stress come from, you ask? From the brain, of course. But not from just any part of the brain. From a very specific part of the brain called the brainstem. The brainstem is the primitive brain located at the base of the human brain. When the brainstem recognizes that we are in danger, it takes control of our body and our actions. The heart rate goes up in order to move oxygen throughout the body. The sweat glands work vigorously to cool us off. And the muscles tense up so that we are prepared for action. And so in prehistoric times, when we walk through the forest, enjoying the birds singing, the trees and fresh air, if a lion suddenly showed up out of nowhere, wanting to devour us... Well, one option was to flee. Wait, don't be scared. Come back, it's just a drawing. The second option was to fight back. And the third option was to freeze in place so that maybe the lion wouldn't see us. And so we have three different types of reactions to danger, which are called the three Fs. The flight reaction, which means to flee. The freeze reaction, which means we can't move. And the fight reaction, which means we fight back. It turns out that stress is very important for our survival. When does it become a problem? The type of stress that helps us is called positive stress, and it encourages us to take action and to achieve the things we dream of. The type of stress that hinders us is called negative stress, and it paralyzes us and makes it difficult for us to achieve our goals. Now let's see how you respond to stressful situations. Pop. Continue, continue. So we try stress. to work with the kids really in this way, so they understand how the brain they understand what they can do, what they cannot do. We also, we have so many movies in this uh, internet site, they can breathe together. Last week, you know, or oh, 10 days ago, we worked in the South in 18 classes. It's a religious kibbutz. And uh, we worked there and worked with the teachers and the kids and so on. And last week, when, you know, 500 missiles, from uh, the south, so we got from the teachers. You know, I have it, you don't understand Hebrew, so I cannot uh, put it, but you know that the teachers said, you don't understand, we are sitting at home, the kids are sitting in their home, and I am sitting and telling them what to do, to breathe, to see this movie and this movie, to do things that we taught them how you know, to react with these uh, kids. So this is an uh, uh, example 
of uh, what we are doing in schools. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we had here in Frankfurt a big conference with um, educational psychology um, and you know, everyone came, I think, uh, and we uh, introduced our work. Uh, and so this is an example of uh, Natal, uh, uh, of what Natal uh, offered. Uh, I want to uh, speak about another thing. I, I said that we are working a lot uh, with the police, uh, firefighters, uh, and uh, hospitals. Uh, for example, in America, um, we just won, like it was seven months ago, uh, a bit um, in the federal uh, bit, and we are training now nine hospitals in uh, New Jersey, for example. We have the knowledge because, unfortunately, you know, we have a lot of uh, medical uh, personnel that suffer uh, from what the others suffer. And uh, we here in uh, uh, Germany, for example, we had again another conference, when was it? Five weeks ago, I think, uh, with firefighters and police, and we are going to work with them also. This is just an example of how we use our uh, knowledge. We also always come to do an assessment, because we believe that, first of all, you need to learn what you have and in every country you have so many things. So we don't need, you know, uh, to come and to teach all the Torah, all the knowledge in the world. We need to come and just to add the things that we think that this is this will help to the society that we are going or to the organization that we are uh, dealing with. And our uh, helpline is something, the last one that I will speak about, but this is a special helpline. You will ask why it's so special. So I will give you an example. It's a long-term support. We have a special helpline for kids and parents and for adults. For example, if Oliver will call me now from next to Gaza, okay, not from Germany, next to Gaza, and I will answer to the phone, and we will do um, like a, an interview, I don't want to use the a professional uh, word, and we will ask him questions, and we can uh, recognize immediately if he suffers from symptoms of post-trauma. Now we have few options. One option, that we will continue and take care of Oliver through the helpline how I will do it. I will call him every week on the same day, on the same time, and we will have a conversation of half an hour. Everything is completely confidential. Some of the people can be three years even in our uh, helpline. Thousands of people are calling uh, Natal, and especially parents that need a lot of adracha, uh, uh, guidance. Uh, to know how to behave with their uh, kids. So this helpline, for example, uh, we built one for the biggest organization in America that deal with veterans that came back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and also came to us the leaders of the African Americans, again in America, and we choose Chicago. Believe me, this is uh, like we always said, the worst place that we could choose Be because... Careful, that's my hometown. I know, we love Chicago there. This is the reason that we choose, because of liberal lives. But in any case, now they have a lot of urban violence. When they came to us, they said, listen, we want, we have a trauma center in Tel Aviv. All of you are really, will be more than happy that you will come to visit and to see. And they came to see and they said, wow, we need this trauma center. So we said, why? Because listen, they said, we have like 800 kids that got kid, get kids every year in uh, uh, Chicago. So we say, okay, but you have so many things in America, you don't need all this uh, building. So we came 
And we did in Chicago, we built a community first of all, because we believe in partnership. This is the reason that we always look for partnership of Chicago University, Northwestern University, Mount Sinai in Chicago, United Way, the municipality of uh, Chicago, the Jewish Federation, because we call it Tikkun Olam. Tikkun Olam, it's like fixing the world, it's our life. What are we talking about? But we believe that if we share knowledge and we can help to people in a different place in the world, so this is really, the feeling is Tikkun Olam. And after the assessment, we offer them completely different thing of what we thought on the beginning. For the finishing payment. Uh, what the, the example of uh, that we learn that the African American will never go to a shrink, they call it a shrink, you know, like a psychology. And we said, okay, so what we are doing with it? And we decided to work with pastors. And we trained until now more than 20 pastors uh, in Chicago that they are working with the helpline, with our mobile uh, uh, unit. And the last thing that we learned, by Zeu, and the last thing that we learned in the assessment, that we uh, took a group of young ones from the age of 14 and we asked them, what is your dream in the future? And they said, we want to live until the age of 20. So just to understand that we came to a different place, a different culture. And if you will have time later, we'll show you an interview in Channel 9 in Chicago with the head of the pastors that is telling about the work with Natalia. So, it was not. So, you have to all the questions I was going to ask you, uh, but since you are talking and you said you were focusing on the United States and Germany, um, I mean, there are also a lot of other countries. Sure. Um, what, what was the approach you actually took? What, what actually happened that put you on the radar of the German ambassador, because if you were caught off guard and you flipped over on the floor, it means there must have been a surprise that they were actually right. focused on you. What, what was right. the secret that maybe other people can also learn? Okay. So first of all, this is the question that we ask the ambassador, and we said, why Natalo? How did you... So, media, so um, he read a few articles in the German uh, media about uh, uh, Natal and about, I think that we are very professional and we keep it all the time and I think that they learn from what they read and they started to check, you know, you know, to check it very well and they found that the organization is first of all we won a special award to be the best NGOs in Israel that shkifut uh, echomrim completely. I mean, nothing is not uh, you know high. You can learn everything about the organization of uh, economic uh, situation in our uh, organization to every uh, other uh, things. And they, I don't know. I think that it was not just luck. I think that. Uh, it was really uh, the best decision that they could do. <laughs> Very objective. <laughs> well, I mean, it depends on the, part, the, the, the perspective we're sitting at. Uh, but it sounds, I mean, I, I would say that is probably one of the most important things, um, is to show professionality. Um, and I think a lot of people underestimate the power of media. Um, passive, even passively, people get information, and if it's often enough, then they start realizing, oh, there must be even some legitimacy to it. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, I think one of the, one of the uh, things that impresses people here, at least at the Israel Congress, is what is Israel's image? What, is, what image is Israel gaining from this kind of uh, cooperation um, for you personally? And then uh, where, where can, because, I mean, Israel is, let's say, very often in the media, um, and it's not always very flattering. Um, so where, where, where can this kind of work, let's say, help 
people understand that Israel is a country of human beings, where there are good things and less good things, and sometimes bad things that, that happen. So for my generation, uh, when we are thinking about Israel, we have pictures in our minds, and these pictures are coming from maybe textbooks in schools, uh, maybe movies in the cinema, maybe from the Bible, and uh, these are the pictures. And um, the good thing we are doing with the cooperation with Czech Tov, that we are meeting people person to person. So I think this is the most important thing, uh, that we are not thinking about something abstract, uh, but we know people very concretely and, uh, and feel uh, how they do, how they work, how they live. And um, I think this is the, the most important thing for the cooperation, uh, that people meet people, people with and without handicapped, meets people with and without handicap from Israel and Germany. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, we can we can come together. I think this is the most important um, thing we can do. And, and what is? I mean, there are probably many, but just list me one thing that you would say has really changed your way of operating uh, from what you learned from the Israelis. And then the question goes then to the Israelis: What's one thing? you would say has changed in your operation that was really something special that you gained from the German partners? It was the um, attitude um, towards uh, people with handicapped and um, how they how they, they, uh, they are working with them, uh, how they, they, they handle with them. Um, uh, for our organization maybe we often put them um, rose color and say, oh, you have to take care of that and that and that. And uh, we learn from Chekolotov that they give them uh, much more responsibilities uh, for their own life. And uh, so this is something uh, we can change, we can learn from organizations. So handicapped people in, in Israel are, from your, from your, which the knowledge you have gained, are not treated as handicapped, they're just people with another way of having to do with more responsibilities for their own life. They are not not like we are the, the service providers, we not have to protect them. Uh, we can give them advice, we can do, do support, but we are not responsible for, for everything that happen. Yeah. The I would say that um, I would say that in general uh, Israelis are more entrepreneurial and then they run away with something and then they think, okay, how will we manage this? Uh, that's why you see a lot of in the IT world, you have a lot of startup and ideas, but then as quick as they become an operation, they sell the idea yeah. outside. And I think that uh, Israelis and Germans are quite complementary in that aspect, because I think um, German managerial skills are, generally speaking, higher than the one of the Israelis, and I think that uh, there's a lot to be learned about how to maintain big operations, uh, especially. And uh, I think that many NGOs were uh, and Chocolatov as well were very surprised by how uh, organizations in Germany are being managed, maintained, especially when it comes to running operations in a big scale. I always uh, love to learn from the things that we didn't do right, you know, because when we succeed, it's, it's great, but when you, you don't succeed, this is the problem. And when we started, I think that we thought that we know everything. The meaning is that we will come and we will give our advice. Everyone will accept them immediately. And we, on the beginning, and then we learn very fast that first of all we learn a lot of knowledge and we have a lot to learn even with all our uh, experience. And we learn to do the dialogue. We learn to do the partnership way on the way that you listen to each other and you appreciate each other. And it's, it's hard to say it uh, because, you know, everyone hides these uh, uh, things like said, what do you mean? The meaning is that we started in a bad way and very fast we learned that this is the way, like you said, that you work with Shekuloto, you speak with each other, you change, you know, uh, uh, knowledge, 
you are going to sign an agreement, I hope so, for all of you, no, really. But this is the way to do it, I really believe in it, and that's what we try to do also now in uh, uh, Germany now. For example, I told you before, with uh, Weissering, I'm sorry, uh, and uh, I hope that on May we are going to have, we will invite you, we are going to have a conference uh, together about volunteers in organization that suffer from trauma. It can be every trauma. Uh, because we ask questions about volunteers that choose to go to organization like this. And the question is, for example, are you going to say after two years or three years to a volunteer, you know what, it's enough. You had enough, you heard enough, you support enough. It's better to change the uh, volunteers. Or say no, come, stay for 10 years, and if you feel good with it, stay with it. But it's not so easy. You need to ask the question. You need to put on the table, you know, our responsibility of these volunteers. And it's interesting that this is the subject that we choose uh, to have a conference uh, together. And my, my last question, we have just less than, well, we have about seven minutes. So my last question, and then and anybody else has a question, um, it's to you. Um, What's the next step? I mean, you're, you're looking for different countries uh, to cooperate with. How do you approach that? Um, so I think uh, the first point is to have a solid market research. Uh, we should look on the EU and OECD and try to identify uh, mutual challenges because uh, the, these kind of relations can only be happening if you identify mutual challenges. Um, mutual challenges can be uh, when you talk about social uh, world um, can be specifically around, uh, I think, employment. Uh, we see in the Western country, uh, in Western countries, we see a growing uh, and uh, society is becoming older. And when society is becoming older, meaning we all need to support the people that are getting old. Therefore, we all need to ensure that the employment market stays around 70% employment, and otherwise, we're all going to go bankrupt. And this is the kind of thing that goes behind uh, the economic reasons that are behind pushing people with disabilities into the workforce and exclude communities into the workforce and, uh, and to bring about IT, uh, the, um, a lot of, uh, I want to say, it's not the potential of the IT markets to more and more exclude communities because social challenges and economic opportunities and economic challenges has to meet together. Otherwise, it will not work. And um, if we can go back to our governments and say, if the fact that 1,000 people with uh, disabilities are now working in mines and not sitting at home, it means that they are more healthy, they are less uh, hospitalized in uh, mental health institutions, which is also the money, they uh, contribute to the economy and not necessarily get uh, big uh, um, funds. So we see where social uh, movements and the social goals come together with economic, uh, with economic goals. And when we look for partnerships to Israel and civil society organization overseas, we look for exactly this kind of interest where we meet each other um, together. Because both Natal and Shikulato are able to show the Israeli government that for any shekel that have been invested in them, we say five or six or ten shekels to the Israeli economy in general. And that's the language which you don't speak. It sounds like a very smart language. Any questions? Any questions? Well, that means I must have asked the right questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, then thank you everybody for having participated, having listened, and um, if you uh, have any ideas for our panelists to expand in partnerships that they can uh, look into, whether they be in Germany or in other countries, please make sure to contact them. And uh, yeah, if there's anything that you find that Europe Israel Press Association can do working in the soft power area, uh, would be interesting for news uh, makers. Let me know.
Es llegado, ¿no? ¿Cuánto tiempo tienes? Tú. Porque tengo que moderar un más programa. Ok, solo, solo. Many of the opposite sides of the world is work in Chicago share some important similarities when it comes to violence. That common ground has created a special bond and provided new hope in helping Chicago deal with the devastating effects of gun violence. Chicago pastor Chris Harris had a life-changing visit to Tel Aviv, Israel. While there, he noticed the similarities suffered by those in war-torn areas and those living in some areas of Chicago. Pastor Harris sought assistance from an Israeli organization called Natal. Now together, they're working to help Chicago. Many Chicagoans make balk at the comparison of our city to a war zone. In Israel, they have to worry about missiles. But in Chicago, they're daily counting body bags and tote bags. And they're going in too. The Chicago pastor Chris Harris saw some striking similarities when he visited Tel Aviv in 2012. I was in the Holy Land. I believe that this was God revealing to me an assignment that I should take on in my life. While there, he discovered an organization called Natal. It's a trauma center established to treat victims of terror and war suffering from post-traumatic stress. The light bulb really went off in my head saying, if the people in Israel, in this war-torn area, who suffer from PTSD, come to this place for post-trauma counseling, could we not bring this model to Chicago? Last February, 12 clinical psychologists traveled from Natal in Israel to Chicago and trained Harris and other pastors on how to treat those in their communities suffering from trauma. Harris says the staggering numbers of shootings and killings in Chicago leave people in trauma and pain, but many don't seek professional counseling. Nobody wants to be labeled crazy, but they still come and talk to the faithful. Harris, along with local faith leaders, developed the Turn Center, or the Urban Resilience Network. The Turn Center did its own research and found that two-thirds of students in the Bronzeville area schools worried about the safety of their family and friends. 35% of you reported clinical level symptoms of depression. And when you peel that scab up, there's still a wound right there. And if it goes unaddressed, it can literally manifest itself through anger and through resentment and through violence. Natal also has a telephonic support system where people suffering from trauma can speak directly with a counselor on a regular basis. The Turn Center recently launched a hotline of its own. Pastor Harris says he's grateful for the opportunity to learn from the folks at Natal. It was great to know that people who don't look like us and people who don't live like us actually want to help to protect us, help to build resilience in us. And that warmed my heart. The term hotline was launched over the summer. Pastor Harris says they will continue to train any pastors who are interested in the program. For more information, you can just head to our website. That's www.wgc.com. Thank you very much. Thank you.